Yeah, it's going into this. It felt like uh, everything that we we wanted to do or not do was going to be based on the development of our team and the development of the young core. So you take in all of that, um, you look at every situation, certainly leading up to the deadline, being proactive with making phone calls, making sure teams understood position in all ways from, you know, any, any whether it was players out there or potential being a broker to, you know, our own UFAs, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, for me, it was always about what was best for this group moving forward. What was the best thing for the development of this group and really wanted to be mindful of putting these players in a position to keep getting better, keep getting better. And I, I like the, what I'm seeing in terms of our team and the dynamic and the locker room and the growth of players. And so um, that was the balance as we went into it um, and as we went through the last few days. Just in case, not any offers that were any good. Well, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's like so, uh, you know, I, I guess what I'd say specifically to that, um, like take, take Craig Anderson and Mark Pissick would be the two examples I would use to say what those guys do every day and what they've done every day um, and the impact they've had on the culture of our team and then certainly the way they've performed. But it's bigger than that for me. Is really powerful. And when you make a decision um, and if you pull something, those types of people away from it, uh, it's tough. So, um, yeah, at the end of the day, um, would we have been open to doing more and, you know, for sure uh, making more moves? But we were not, we had a plan. We were going to stick to the plan. We weren't going to let the emotion of a deadline or any sort of pressure change our plan. Um, and that's what we did. And I do, I'll go back to say it again, Mike, I just really believe. Um, this next 19 games for our group is so important. It's important that we continue to push ourselves, continue to hold each other accountable, continue to grow. And I felt that the position that we've put ourselves in um, with the group we have will allow us to keep doing that. And, you know, that's why. In that sense, in, how important has this process been in learning how to win? Whereas, you know... You were facing all the criticism, all the val- you know, all the valleys back in December and January, and how how important has this, that that process been to where we could see some kind of a light at the end, at least a glimpse of a light at the end of the tunnel after these last couple of you know a couple of weeks. It's honestly, John, it's, it's huge because um, every time we step on the ice, we want to win hockey games. I've been saying that since I've I've had the job, um, but how you how you your process of what you do every day in practice your process of how you play within a game i'm a big believer ultimately leads to the results and what our group has started to learn this year is by playing the game the right way by doing things shift in and shift out um puck decisions length of shifts i mean all those types of things ultimately can can end in uh wins or losses so what we've seen lately is our group take a step of maturity and um, it's been nice to see our process of our game better and then to get rewarded for it. But I do believe that winning um, is a product byproduct of doing those things. And then winning also um, is a feeling within the group of confidence that, okay, we've, we've done the right things and then we got rewarded. And that to me has um, been a good step for us. We talked about the win over Vegas and the Irish Classic win, but after the Oilers game, the response, just what did you see in these last two overtime wins? Well, it, it, maturity is one word I'd use for it to say, um, to look inside. You know, it's uh, that's part of what I'm talking about with the group, to look inside in the locker room and say, okay, that wasn't good enough in Edmonton. Why wasn't it good enough? Well, the answer is within the room, and now let's figure it out. And that's a huge step for us, by the way, to go into two tough buildings and very good teams and to answer the way our group did. So that goes back to my point of of when you're developing as a team and when you're developing young players, those experiences can exponentially jump you forward. And if you take maybe some of that away from our guys based on making decisions or changing things, um, you know, maybe there's a setback there. So that's kind of all the balance that I wanted to make sure um, that we are putting our players in a position to grow here, you know, as we as we play these next 19 games. 
guy like Colin Miller, was there just not enough time for him to prove that he's over his injury as far as when you had talks about it? He only could play in two yeah, honestly, uh, Colin and I have a really good relationship. He's a great pro. He's a great person. I've been honest with him back and forth um, through this process. Uh, certainly was, you know, for his sake, if there was an opportunity to do something, would I, I just think that the health, um, you know, coming off an injury that he was coming off of, there are obviously teams that are looking to add and go on a deep playoff run. There's questions around that um, they want to make sure. So I think, I mean, that was pretty clear through this of, you know, what, why we ended up with, you know, that's the situation we have with Colin getting back into the lineup so late and getting cleared so late close to the trade deadline. Did you ever have to really have the conversation with Anderson at all? That yeah, well, it did in terms of um, we, we spoke. Yeah, we, well, no, not ultimately there, but we spoke again this morning. I wanted to, although he, poor guy, got off the plane. I didn't go to, uh, you know, flew all night, and he sounded tired but ex happy. And I just, another conversation just to make sure that I wanted to make sure this organization does the right things um, in a first class way and does the right things for the people that have done so much for us. And I put Craig in in a really short time. He is, he's done a lot for our organization. So I wanted to make sure one more time we had the conversation. Um, and, you know, he reiterated that, uh, yeah, that there was an opportunity possibly, maybe it would be, it would be great for him in a certain place. Um, and I, you know, also, and he also said, I love it here. And I, and I've been, you know, this has been an amazing organization to be part of and, you know, wanted to be here, which was a big deal to me. Rochester. We did. So we assigned uh, Peyton Krebs, Samuelson, and Fitzy, um, but then we're calling them back up. So um, what that does, you know, for those of you in the room that don't know, is it allows us to um, potentially move them down. You know, if we were to get into the playoffs or whatever, they'd have the opportunity in Rochester to play. So uh, I just think that that would be great if Rochester was able to be in a, in a playoff spot. Um, have those guys available with the other young players that we're, that we're pretty excited about down there. Um, and then, you know, under a best case scenario, maybe they could go on a run and um, do it together. And I, so that's why we wanted to make sure we did that. Before we forget, is, so John Hayden is, he's still out west. Yeah, so he is. Um, fortunately, the hotel's nice in Vancouver, so he's uh, beautiful mountains and ocean, but uh, yeah, um, he feels fine. Asymptomatic, like, just was almost, you know, surprised, obviously, but uh, um, hopefully it's, he can test out, you know, there's certain criteria with numbers and back-to-back -back days of testing, but hopefully we'll be seeing him in a few days, but yeah, he is still out in Vancouver right now. Will you start seeing some of your younger players back now that you can expand the roster? You can only, you, you, you can only have just, so you know, four recalls though, so we've left ourselves one spot. But the other way it could happen is if you got into an emergency recall situation. So, I, you know, and you've heard me say this before. Um, to me, it's about the development piece, you know. So whether it's if a guy's in Rochester, um, UPL, or, you know, Jack Quinn or J.J. Paterka, or just name the player. If they're in Rochester and I'm comfortable with the development path they're on and the – the way they're handling themselves and what they're learning and growing, or if a player's here, you know, a Peyton Krebs or a Samuelson or Fitzgerald in this instance, and they're developing and they have the opportunity in the ice time, you know, we kind of take all that into account. So um, right now we're, we're, we're excited about that group, um, both here and there. I'm excited about some of the players that aren't in Rochester either that are going to be a big part of this moving forward and balancing it all. Um, so, would we potentially have one more recall at some point? We could, or if you see, you know, if we were in an emergency situation, then, you know, those other players could be available as well. Yeah, three of the, so there's three of the four. Um, yeah, so you, you just, you're in a position, we dealt with this last year too, where, you know, it's, you like to have the flexibility a little bit, um, just to have the, you know, so one here moving forward, but, it, a lot of it ends up just playing itself out with the roster, depending on the health of our roster and where we're at. But I guess it goes back to um, I do like what I'm seeing in Rochester right now. I was there at the game the other day. Um, I like the way the, our young players especially are playing, um, and I want to just keep keep pushing them forward. This is, was obviously a big weekend for the Adams. Uh, now that you were in the last you know, month or so, how critical is it organizationally in your mind for them to get in the playoffs and get 
get a run, to get those guys that experience. Because for a lot of them, that, that'll be their one chance to get that experience. Yeah, so, like, they – I give Seth Appert and the coaching staff a lot of credit down there with – I mean – Everybody's focused and knows how many injuries we've had and different things we've gone through adversity up here. Well, there's a trickle down effect, and then they've also had their own issues, you know, with injuries. And so they have had a really, really challenging probably six, eight weeks of just trying to piece together a lineup. Um, but in saying that, so then it creates opportunity. Like a player like Brandon Byro, because of the opportunity, stepped up and has been unbelievable, and then he got hurt. Um, so I, we're getting closer to healthy. Uh, really love the response, those two games uh, against Cleveland this past weekend and the way they, they pushed and found a way. Um, yeah, so we're, I guess the way I'd say it is we're not obsessed about it, but at the same point, of course, if we can be in a spot where those guys can get in a playoff situation, can feel what it's like, you know, I mean, it's just something driving to the rink and it's warm out and uh you know, just there's a feeling, um, and I, I, there's no better feeling as a player, and I, so I hope our, our guys can experience that. But uh, you know, they got a lot of hockey in front of them still to, to work through. Chris Costello was really out of his game last night. It felt like he was going to make a huge impact. In the end. Just what's happened to him? Not just in the last few months, even the last few weeks. It seems like it's just another one. Rasmus is uh, he has bought all in on wanting to be here, wanting to be here for the right reason, and wanting to move this franchise forward. I, I've seen it um, just from day one of training camp, the way he um, just looked to me and the presence that he had in the locker room. I do believe, I go back to you surround people with the right people and you bring out the best in them, um, can really be powerful, and I think that's what we've seen from Rasmus. And then that's reflected his on-ice play. He he also knows the, that the coaching staff really believes in him and can be a difference maker every night. And, I, I, you know, I'm watching the game last night, and I did – I got excited with just with what we're seeing in his development and, and where his game is. But I also was thinking, like, he's 21 years old still. You know, like, he, he is an opportunity to keep getting better, keep pushing. Um, and that, for me, is the type of kid he is, and that's the type of people we want in the organization, ones that – are here because they really believe in something that we're going to do here is special, and then they want to get better. And he's got he's got both those qualities. How much do you think that some people have to? It's not in a bad way with like the players up the left, but that some people have to get out of his way for him to start in that role. Yeah, I mean, like so, you know, you go back, you wind it back to um, a year ago, you know, where we were at the trade deadline and just different. Um, things we've moved uh, forward with, you know, over the last, you know, I know it's not a calendar year, but you know what I mean, over the last hockey calendar year, you know, there's been a lot of changes and we, and I've said it again before, and I'm going to keep saying it again and again, if you get the culture right, it brings out um, the opportunity for players to thrive when, when they're in a position that they believe is right for them. And that's what we've been working so hard on. And I think Rasmus is right at the center of that, you know. But Rasmus deserves a lot of credit for his approach and how he's handling himself, what he's doing every day. I mean, he is extremely a hard worker, competitive kid every day in practice, does the right things. But I want to also give credit to the people around him in the locker room that are, are you know, helping that message. The Kyle Postcos, Zemgus Gergensen, Anderson, Pissig, you know what I mean? It could go down the list. So I think it's a combination of all of it. But uh, you know, we're we're excited about where he's at and look forward to him just to keep improving. Would it be accurate to say that there was some talk, you know, going forward, maybe some seeds planted and you can spend all your time in your own UFAs there's some conversation? Yes. Um, you know, so just a couple examples for you. We were in on conversations um, a couple pretty serious ones about a potential broker type of deal where we would have been involved. In fact, on our end, we had kind of agreed on how it could work. And then it didn't end up panning out from the other two teams, you know. So there's a lot of time and there's a lot of work that goes into these. And, uh, um, you know, that's, that's all part of it. Um, so that was something we did and we were really, you know, we were open to them. We were hoping is there a way to take advantage of the cap space. But you need other teams to – to be able to do it with you. So that was one thing, absolutely planted some seeds uh, in terms of the off season. And what I mean by that is conversations about potential 
players that are on teams that maybe we feel are a fit here, but the team said, well, you know, we really need this guy or want this guy for the, for the rest of the season and in the playoffs, but let's talk about it, you know, in the off season. So those seeds are planted. And what I have learned in this job is every one of your conversations, um, there's could be a, it could be compounded into the next one and the next one, things don't happen overnight. So I do feel a lot of work was done there. Um, everybody will probably take a breath here in the next uh, couple of days. And there's the GM meetings next week, um, down in Florida, which will be, which will be nice. Cause then it's maybe some of those conversations that, uh, I've had over the last you know few weeks can pick up again, you know, as we head towards the off season. Uh, playing the way he has, would you be interested now maybe talking to him about a contract extension or is that something you would save until the summer? Yeah, I, I you know, I haven't put a ton of thought into that because I wanted to get the other side of the trade deadline. He's absolutely a player that I feel has been uh, impactful on and off the ice. hes I didn't mention him with the Pisses and Andersons, but I can tell you right now he's had a positive um, effect on our room. His... I don't know how many, how many of you watch practice, but you've heard me say before, like, I do believe practice habits matter. I do believe your practices matter. And Vinny Henestrosa is going all out, every drill, every rep. It all matters to him. And I, I think there's a message that guys like Dylan Cousins get and Peyton Krebs get, and they're playing on a line together right now, like, wow, okay, this is what you have to do in this league. I just think that's, that's important. So he's absolutely a guy that um, I – you know, that I felt again, going into this past couple of days that, uh, you know, you got to, you can make decisions and move, move things around, but, um, it's about these next 19 games and getting the most out of our team and out of our individuals. And he helps us do that. So I'm definitely open to that. Um, but we'll see whether it's sooner or would we push that into the off season and kind of take a breath and then, you know, go through it and go from there. Can you, can you, you can reflect back? Yeah, I mean, you talk about the calendar year, but to, to the last trade of the line, well, yeah, I mean, so the, whew, the second press conference on last year's trade deadline, it was, uh, you know, it was unique because Taylor had a no move clause. You end up getting to a spot where, I mean, you saw it happen a little bit um, with other teams that just, you know, went through this. Um, Ultimately, when the player, you know, you get you get one team you're negotiating with, it can get challenging. But what we were in the middle of last year, we came off a draft where we had, I think, five picks. And I felt strongly that we really needed to get our pipeline deeper and we needed to add. So, you know, through the Eric Stahl trade, through the Montour trade, and then ultimately Taylor, um, we started to add some more picks. And I think then when we made our other other moves, we ended up, I think, with 11 picks last year. We have 10 going into this year's draft, um, which to me mattered um, and how we, decisions we were going to make, too. You're balancing all of that. Um, but, you know, when I look at last year's trade deadline and then I fast forward to now, um, I feel that we are taking the right and appropriate steps, um, methodically making decisions for the right reasons, sticking to our plan, not going to you can't fast forward it you can't rush it um but you have to have a plan and you have to stick with it and i really think it's easy in these type of days to get caught up in the emotion or get caught up in the you want to stress whatever the right word is of the deadline and then you know make decisions that you're that you may regret down the line so i just think that's something we were mindful of you know over the last few days did you still feel some kind of relief? You know, I know you weren't pushing anything, yeah. but was there still some relief to keep the culture building and probably some relief among the players? Yeah, well, I can, I, I'll start with the player part because I lived it as a player. Um, actually, I got a phone call once on trade deadline. I, I thought it was, I was on the other side, but I got a call at 320 that I had been traded. So, um, you know, it's, there, it is a stressful time. I can just tell you, even if you are in a position where you're maybe like hoping to get moved, it's just stressful. You know, your whole world gets turned upside down. You're, you're picking up, you're moving, whatever. So, okay. Now that's something the players have to deal with. Um, for me personally, um, you know, you're, you're, you're so intense. You're so focused on the, the making sure you stick to the plan, making sure you, um, are having the right conversations, making sure that you're, um, staying focused on what matters most, which is 
how we're building this team right here, you know, and so balancing all that. So as you get to three, um, you know, when you get, you get calls or, you know, maybe there's things that happen. See, people try to see at the last minute, can they make a move and try to get you to, to cave or to do something? Um, that's why you surround yourself with good people. Also, it's, uh, it's, it's collaborative in our, in our boardroom. And, you know, I guess we don't, we're not in business. We call it a war room, not boardroom, but you know what I mean? And I think it's, uh, it's, it's fun, but at the same point, um, it's, uh, it's intense. So for sure, you take a little breath after three o'clock and I don't even know what time it is now, but you kind of catch your breath. And, um, and now I turn the page to, you know, what's next, we've got some exciting prospects playing in the college, you know, NCAAs that's coming up this week. I'm going to hit the road and watch some of those guys. Um, Rochester, like we talked about, has some really big games. And then what's going on here? And you, you start to focus on, you know, all of those things. Yeah, would you say that the Hag have the most interest, or was that just the best offer um, A little bit of both. Um Robert Hag, I'm not surprised. There was a lot of teams checking in on him. You know, relatively cheap when it comes to a, you know a quality defenseman that can play a role, especially in the playoffs. Physical, shot blocker, great person, like character, the whole deal. Um, you know, that's the hard part of this job. Where you know, you just I, even when I called him yesterday, you know, I, I think it was a great thing for him. You're going to one of the elite teams that has a chance to win a Stanley Cup, but you know, on the human level, you know, you hate you hate that phone call and saying goodbye. Um, but yeah, I think uh, when I looked at our back end and then you look at potentially who's coming, um, you know, you also want to do do the right thing um, for everyone, the, the player and the organization, and that's that's why we made that move. Kevin, with the three that you, know, you have the paper transaction with today um, with Rochester, were they all well aware in advance that this was coming? Yep. So Fitzgerald uh, got cleared, just so you know, medically. That that was a piece of this um, coming into today because he, he had to go through all the, you know, the, the proper medical steps and everything. So once he was cleared, um, I had previously talked to him. And you guys know my style. I, I talked to I talked to the players directly. I never hide anything. Um, I also talked to the agents. So there was no, um, you know, question on what we were going to do. Um, they understood. In fact, I got to tell you, like, um, all three of them were pretty excited in a way. The thought of saying, yeah, like if that, you know, the playoffs is going on, I want to be part of that, which I think says a lot about the character of those three because that's not always the case, I can tell you. Yeah, and then if, if everything was equal and there's, you know, stability injury wise with both clubs and you've only got this one recall left, do you already have in your mind who you would want to bring up in that situation? Because you can imagine the fan base three or four guys on the <laughs> he, list. Yeah, so um, I don't want to say that I have different scenarios in my mind. So let's say it plays itself out in different ways. Maybe, you know, maybe we don't use it at all. Like, we'll see. But um, what did play a part in this for me was you know, J.J. Paterka had played a couple NHL games this year. Jack Quinn played a couple NHL games this year. And certainly, um, you know, when he got hurt was – was playing really well and probably would have had a chance to play more at that point. So to me, there's value in feeling what it's like to step on an NHL ice surface. And just Brandon Byro got that this year. And um, I think there's something mental about that in, for me uh, to sit, when a player can say, okay, I know what the, I know what it's like now. And then it's, I belong there. I got to work to get there. I, here's what I need to do. The game happened a little faster, whatever it is. Um, and I talked to those players, by the way, about what they felt and what were they processing after the game. It also matters for them going into the off season that, okay, no one's asking me, what's it going to be like when you play in the NHL? You know what it's like, you know, and now I know two games is two games, but you know what, you, you get my point. So I, I do feel good that um, a group of those guys have played now, had the feeling, um, and we're pretty excited about those guys. So it's uh, it's they're going to be a big part of you know what we're what we're doing here moving forward. Um, I think there's no secret to that. You know how we feel about Jack Quinn. What he's doing right now is exceptional. Um, JJ Paterka, what he's doing at his age is exceptional. Um, UPL, he knows how we feel about him. He's going to be a big part of this moving forward. So um, these are guys that you know. I tell him be present. You know, don't wake up every day thinking about. You know, here, wake up every day thinking about what do I need to do to be the best possible player I can be, and then it all takes care of itself. And I think those guys have bought into that, so that's good on them, especially at that age.
Good? 410, by the way. 410, all right. I'm going to get home for dinner still. That's good. <laughs>